All right, again, Charlie, thank you so much for sharing your story. And uh, we all love a good story, don't we? I love hearing testimonies that people give about how Jesus has transformed their lives. But even outside of those stories about Jesus, we all, I think in life, just love a good story, don't we? Whether it's a story being told through film, whether it be a story being told in a book. I know this is definitely true um, at home for my kids. Many, many times, one of their favorite things to do is just to be read a story. And sometimes we'll use that as motivation at bedtime. Hey, if everybody gets ready for bed and you're all good and everything, and, and it's early enough, we'll read you a story before you go to bed. Because there's just something about a story that we as humans enjoy. They play an important role in our culture today. And the same thing has really been true throughout history. In fact, history itself uh, is nothing more than his story. Did you know that? History itself is God's story, his story being written uh, every day as we go throughout our life. And as you study the pages of scripture and you study the ministry of Jesus, you know that one of his favorite ways of teaching was a method called parables. A parable is simply an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So many, many times, Jesus, as a way of introducing truth to his disciples by trying to disguise it to those who really weren't seeking sincerely, he would tell this parable, this story that has a spiritual dynamic to it, but yet it seems like a very earthly story on the surface. And so that was Jesus, one of Jesus' main methods of teaching truth to his father, or to his followers. He was a master at using parables in order to convey spiritual truth to those who would listen. And so today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 22. And in this chapter, we are going to see Paul really share with us his story, share with us his testimony. And as we look at this passage, our goal is to not just simply get acquainted with Paul and the details of his story, but it is my prayer and my hope that as we look at his story, we will develop a passion for sharing our own story. And so let's dive in here to Acts chapter number 22. It's a little bit of a lengthy passage compared to some that we cover, uh, but I think it's a passage that really should be covered in its entirety. And so I'm going to begin reading in verse number one. Uh, the, the words will be on the screen behind me, but I encourage you to look down at your Bibles. Uh, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says this, Brothers and fathers, hear the offense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet, and he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, and brought up in the city, educated in the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as a high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be witness for me, him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, while you wait, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in, believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen and your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, 
for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the bear, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, Well, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. I want to draw your attention to the first verse that says, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So if you're taking notes, the simple title of our message today is simply this. Your great Defense, Because as Paul stands before this crowd of Jewish people who have gathered, who this mob that has gathered, wanting to see his life taken from him, he is going to use his story as a defense about who Jesus is and how Jesus can transform our lives. And so, Father, we just thank you again for this time that we have together. We thank you for your word that is open before us this morning. And Father, I thank you that in all the things that go on around us and all these people who are supposed to be living in their own truth, Lord, I thank you that you give us an absolute truth that we can come to here in the pages of Scripture. Lord, words that were breathed out by you, words that were penned by many authors over a 1,500-year time period, but yet there's no contradiction, and we know that, Father, all the prophecies that, Father, were mentioned have come true or Lord, we look forward to the song that are yet to come true. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Father God, just how it speaks to our hearts. And so now I pray that you will move me aside. But, God, that you will use your word, Lord, through the power of your spirit to speak to our hearts today. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've been with us, you know that one thing that clearly stands up in the life of Paul is the love that he had for the Jewish people. Paul was a, a Jewish man, and he had a great love for the Jewish people. Time and time again, we find him attempting to bring the gospel to the Jewish people. In fact, in most of the cities where he would go, he would first find a synagogue in hopes of you know, meeting some Jewish people there and through the Old Testament being able to point them to Jesus. Romans 9.3 gives us a little bit of a view into the heart of Paul for his people as it says this, I am speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I mean, just think about his heart that is just oozing for love of his people. He says, I would be willing to be cast away. I would be willing to be accursed at the name of Christ if those who are my fellow countrymen would come to know the saving power of Jesus. Yet, despite his love for the Jews, we find that God's primary calling on his life was to actually take the gospel to the Gentile people. As hard as Paul tries, and as often as he tries to, you know, bridge the gap to the Jews, we see most of his success is coming and sharing the gospel with the Gentile people that are there and that are in the various cities in which he finds. And so as we come to Acts, number, Acts chapter 22, we find Paul in the city of Jerusalem. If you've been with us, you know this marks the end of his third missionary journey, and he was just bent on getting to Jerusalem for the day, for the for the Feast of Pentecost. And so he was arrived in Jerusalem. And I have the map up here. Uh, I thought I had the map up here. Uh, Brian will pull it up. And uh, we've been following his, his journey 
here as he's traveled around, starting in Antioch, his home church, his sending church. And he's traveled all the way through Asia, spent much of his time in Ephesus, three years there in Ephesus. And then he's collecting money because in Jerusalem they are going through a famine, they are going through some hardships, some persecution. And so Paul is going to all these other churches and helping to gather a collection that he can bring with him to Jerusalem. And so last week we find that he finally arrives there in Jerusalem. And as he arrives, they are excited to see him. They, they, they uh, are welcome him gladly, uh, not only because he has the offering to help them in their time of need, but they're just excited to see Paul. And so he begins his time there in Jerusalem just sharing about all that God has done in that third missionary journey, just telling them story after story about how God had been working in the hearts of Gentiles all throughout the region. And they're excited to hear about it, but there's a problem. These elders in the church in Jerusalem know that there have been rumors being spread about the Apostle Paul. There have been false accusations that are being made about Paul and what it is he is teaching. You see, there were many in Jerusalem who thought that Paul was teaching them to disband and, and leave Mosaic Law behind in order to turn to follow Christ. Now, that was in no way what... Uh, Paul was teaching, but yet that was a rumor that was being spread. That was some false accusations that were being uh, made there on the Apostle Paul. And so because Paul is in the city, that this mob has gathered. They have beaten Paul. They have dragged him out of the temple before his life was eventually spared by the tribune. And so that's where we pick up here in chapter number 22. As he's having this conversation with this leader, this tribune, Paul asks if he can address the people. Now the tribune's surprised because as he talks to this tribune, he speaks Greek. And the tribune's like, well, are you not the Egyptian who gathered all this, this band of assassins? And, and, and Paul says, no, that's not me. And so he's surprised that Paul is speaking Greek. And, and so he, he allows Paul to... Speak to the people. This, this crowd, this mob that has gathered, Paul asked to speak to them. Now, put yourself in that situation for a second. You have this opportunity to speak to those who are calling for your life. You have this opportunity to speak to those who want to see nothing more than you dead. What would you say? What would you tell them? What would you accuse them of? What kind of names would you call them? But that is not what Paul does. We see Paul, again, having a heart for his people, wants to try to point them in this last resort effort. He has no idea what's going to happen from this moment on. He has no idea whether these will be the last words that he speaks or not. And so when he considers all that, he says, you know what? The best thing I can do is simply tell them about how Jesus has transformed my life. And that's exactly what he does. And so here in chapter 22, we have an in-depth kind of look at Paul's testimony. And you can find these events back in Acts chapter 9, and we talked about a lot of them as we've been walking through the book of Acts. And so my point for us today is just to understand that just like Paul had a story, and just like Charlie had a story, all of us have a story. Whether or not we are followers of Jesus or not, all of us have a story about our life and where our life started and all the things that have happened in our life up to where we are today. But the beautiful thing about Paul's story is that he didn't just have a story, he had a testimony of what God had done in his life. And so that's what I want us to look at today, the testimony that Paul gives here in Acts chapter 22. And as we do that, I want us to be thinking about our own story. Because notice here in this passage, he says, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I will now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So here we have this loud mob that is yelling and screaming, away with him, away with him, wanting to see Paul killed. And as he speaks to them in the common language, most likely Aramaic in their day, they begin to quiet. Wait, he's speaking our language. And so they begin to listen to what it is that Paul has to say. And it says, hear the defense that I make now before you. You see, that word defense comes from the Greek word apologia 
which is where we get the term apologetics. Now, those of you who have grown up in Christian circles probably have heard that word apologetics before, but let me kind of just give you an idea of what that word means. It simply means the science of giving a defense of the Christian faith. And so what Paul is going to do here is he is going to defend his faith in Jesus by simply telling his own story about what Jesus had done in his life. You see, Paul understood that the best defense for Christianity in this situation was to simply share his testimony. Now again, your testimony is a story of your encounter with God and the role that he has pay, pay, played throughout your life. That's the way somebody has described this idea of testimony. The story of your encounter with God and the role he has played throughout your life. And so we see, as he begins to share his story, the people get quiet. Now, remember, Paul is a very educated man. Paul has been to the most prestigious of Jewish uh, synagogues and, and gone through all of the different learning and all of the different training and education. He could have very easily begun to explain to them from the Old Testament and pointed them to Jesus. He could have done a lot of different things in this moment to try to point them to Jesus. But the method that he uses is simply by telling his story, giving them his testimony. And again, I tell you, some of the most powerful things or words that you can say to somebody are simply sharing your story. You see, so often I find people who are intimidated to uh, speak about Jesus because in their mind they think, well, I don't know enough Bible verses to talk to somebody about Jesus. I don't know what I would say in trying to point somebody to Jesus. Can I tell you? If Jesus has changed your life, you have all that you need to say right there in that fact alone. And I think that Paul gives us a great example here of just how easy it is for us to share our story. You see, people can give various opinions and argue with us theologically. Some people begin with a framework where they don't even believe the Bible. And so it's hard to use Bible verses to talk to somebody who is skeptical about the Bible. Would you agree? But one thing people cannot argue with is what you have experienced firsthand in your life. And especially so if they see a transformation that has taken place in your life as a result of Jesus. I know I am amazed so many times when I hear stories like Charlie's and see other people, when I knew what they were like then, and when I see them now, and I see that the difference in then and now is simply Jesus. And you see, that is a powerful way to defend our faith. I love what it says in John. There's a story about Jesus who heals this blind man. And uh, in these verses, uh, we start in verse number 18. It says this, The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. And so they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. So this man is healed. He's, he's given his sight back. Jesus just allowed this blind man to see and all these religious leaders are skeptical. And so they ask his parents to come. They ask him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son, right? We know this is our son and that he was born blind. He says, we can give testimony to that fact. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. So his parents say, hey, we know this is our son. And we know that for his whole life he was blind. Now, we weren't there when he got his sight back, but he's old enough that he can tell you himself. So verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner talking about Jesus. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. So he wasn't about to debate with them about, you know, the sinfulness of Jesus or any of those things. But notice what he does. He says, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Right? He is giving testimony to the fact, right? Listen, I don't know everything about this man, Jesus. I don't know everything about the one who healed me. There's a lot, whether he's a sinner or a prophet or who he is, I don't know all those things. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Right? What he's doing is he is giving them physical evidence, personal evidence from his life experience about what his life 
now is. I was blind, but now I see. And he knew that this man named Jesus is the one who gave him his sight. And so they couldn't argue with the results. They couldn't argue with it. His parents agreed, yeah, he was born blind. Yeah, this is our son. Jesus was the one who made the difference. And so today as we look at Paul's story, the first thing I want us to see is the framing of your story. Because again, I want us to personalize this. Paul's giving his testimony here, but all of us should hopefully have a testimony about how Jesus has transformed our lives. And if not, I hope that as we see Paul's testimony, you can see just the veracity of who Jesus is. And you can choose today that you want to have a testimony about how Jesus can change your life. So personalizing this, let's look at how, we, how it is that we frame our story. All right, so I already had it up there. There we go. Framing of your story. There's three things I think we see here that Paul does as he frames his testimony. and something that really is a good outline for you and I if we are going to share our story with those around us. The first thing he's going to talk about is his conduct before coming to Christ. Then he's going to talk about his conduct or his, conver his conversion to Christ, and then he's going to talk about his calling from Christ. So the first thing, his conduct before coming to Christ. What did his life look like before he met Jesus? And Paul makes it very clear about the kind of man that he was. He talks about how he was born in Tarsus, that he was a Jew, that he was brought up in the city and educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Now all the people there in Jerusalem would have known who this man Gamaliel was, because he was kind of the foremost of rabbis in that day. And so for Paul to have been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel was a big deal. In fact, it's said that Gamaliel's only issue with training Paul was that he never had enough books for Paul. Paul was just going through books and learning so quickly that Gamaliel's only complaint about Paul was he didn't have enough books to keep for Paul. And so Paul says, listen to all these Jewish people I am just like you. I was zealous for God. I was brought up in the same schools, the same synagogues as many of you. I was the foremost of the Jewish men that were being brought up. And he talks about when they stoned Stephen, the first martyr we find in the New Testament, the first follower of Jesus who was killed as a result of believing in Jesus. Paul says, listen, when he was stoned and when he was put to death, I was there giving my consent as I held the coats of those who were throwing stones at him. And he talked about how he was so zealous for God and so zealous for Judaism that when this new religion known as the way or Christianity popped up, he made it his mission to stamp out Christianity there within Jerusalem. And it says that he would even go as far as Damascus. He got permission to go to Damascus and to take those who were worshipers of Jesus to drag them out and to send them into prison. And so here Paul is giving us a, an idea, giving us a background about the kind of man he was. A murderer, a religious zealot who was zealous for God and Judaism, but in no way a follower or believer of Jesus. In fact, it was his mission to stamp out Christianity wherever he saw it rising up. And so at the end of the day, what Paul is doing here in the beginning is he's telling us what his life was like before meeting Jesus. He is highlighting the fact that he is a sinner who was in need of a Savior. His religion still left him empty. His religion was not enough to fulfill him. 